Hello, my friends. Welcome to Living the Liminal Show this week. I am so glad you're here with us. Um, I just keep having more and more fun with this platform. I don't know about you, but it just keeps amazing me who comes and the kinds of things we get to talk about and the, the, the stories we get to tell and just what a blessing it is to have a space like this that just seems so sacred and so fun and so exhilarating in a way, kind of like going to an amusement park all the time. So I'm so glad you're here. And I'm even more thrilled to be able to present my new, my guest today. Um, he, this conversation is gonna just blow us all away, I think, because literally it is so um, joy filled with all goodness. And you know how I am about getting into those kinds of conversations and, and, and giving the world more goodness because we just all deserve it. So I want to welcome um, Faust Ruggiero. He has been counseling and serving the world in like the most amazing ways for 40 years or so. He is a psychologist in a private practice, a radio show host for Fix It With Faust on healthylife.net radio and the author of an awesomely cool book, The Fix It Yourself Handbook, which I cannot wait for us to talk about. Helping people is literally his mission. You know, we talk about that passion and that purpose. He has found his. So I'm so excited for this conversation today. So Faust, welcome to Living the Liminal Show. Christy, thanks so much for having me aboard. It's great to be here. Um. I usually ask people like how their work found them, but I'm going to ask you a little different way. Mm -hmm. So your work, I mean, when I was sort of reading like the, your background and your bio and all that stuff that you sort of send, you know, as we prep for this, I mean, you have been working with what I consider to be a wide range of people. I mean, it sort of ran the gamut. And I got this sense that like your work was more like a calling to you. So how did you know that helping people was really your purpose? You no, know, I, I get that question a lot, uh, Christy. And, and what I find when I, when I look back is I was, I was just really the, just that guy. I was the kid that uh, uh, you, you saw in maybe junior high school and someone had a problem and I was immediately attracted to that. I, I love to listen to people. I am a good listener, but then they reciprocated. They always came to me. It was just a natural thing. And I, I, I would ask myself, why are they confiding this thing in me? This is so personal, but, yet, but yeah. it just flows right out of them. And they wouldn't dare say that to anyone else. So, you know, when that's happening, you're, it, it's reinforcing all the time. Well, I, I think I'm pretty good at this. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm helping this person. And then they keep coming back. Then the next person comes, then you start to you know, be validated. You say, well, you know, I guess I am pretty good at this thing. So it just took off from there. That's beautiful because I feel like there's so many people out there and, and they're wondering what, what do I do and how can I, you know, we find jobs, but how can I find work that really serves my soul? And I feel like when you, when you start to watch the experiences you're having and how you feel in those experiences, that sort of says a lot to where you're being guided to do your best and the goodness for the world. And it does, you know, I mean, I, I think you have to like what you do. And again, I'm one of those people who have uh, been doing this for, for four decades and people will say, wow, that's a lot of work, a lot of hours. And I say, yeah, I don't know that I ever went to work. You know, I got up, I mean, I'm, I'm still doing it. I still get up and I still counsel people and take the telephone calls in different hours of the night and what have you. And I still love what I'm doing. So I can't say that I get up any day and say, oh, gee, I'm at the office. Here I go again. Yeah, it just it's it just flows. And I, the next one, I, every one of them is a gift. I mean, you know, everything if you if you look at it, everything in life is you just got to be you have to have your perspective oriented in that direction. And that's that's the key to all this. Oh, my gosh, totally. And I feel like where we've been, especially in the last couple of years, looking at everything as a gift is challenging. It's hard for people. Don't well, you think? Well, you know why? Because we've trained our brains 
to look at the negative or, or not to be satisfied. We get something and we're looking for the next thing and the next quick fix and, and what have you. And uh, you know, we, we need to start looking on the inside and saying, I got everything I need. I get a few things out there. That's great. I don't need all this stuff. I don't need to be negative about everything that goes on. And, and, and the beauty is all around us. You just got to be willing to go get it. Sometimes I've been trying this lately where I recognize that I have kind of like a, a negative or icky kind of thought about something. And I'll go, I think I'm just going to let it go. I'm not going to say anything, right? I'm not going to call a friend. I'm not going to go tell my husband about it. I'm just going to sit and just sort of let it float out of me. It's been interesting to watch it. There's something about that. It creates more space within you to then, I think that's what you're talking about when you say shift the perception. You know, what you did is really just tell me that you are retraining your brain to do something a little different. And again, I keep telling people to learn to do something different is, is about, you know, the whole learning process is repetition mm -hmm. over time. It's to take something that can work for you, even if it's difficult, begin yeah. to do it and then realize after a period of time, it's starting to become automatic. And what you said right there is really what I do. If something comes into my mind and I don't like it or it's going to be negative or kind of hit the dark side or worry or, 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 or anger or whatever, I just consciously say to myself, I'm not going there. And I, I will go do something else. And, and I'll put my mind in the moment as opposed to past or present or future. Mm -hmm. And I will, I'll mark, I call marking the moment. I will put, I focus on something in the moment uh, talk about how I like that. I don't care if it's the butterfly outside or the television show or whatever it may be. Something is going to be in my in my life at that moment that I can say I like, and I am not. And I will consciously say I am not going to that negative thing because if I don't, you know what happens? The mind wraps around it, and the next thing we know, it's it's hours and hours of negativity. And it rolls in from one moment to another moment to another moment, and then it's big and it didn't even really need to be that big. Wasn't That's a big right. deal. Yeah. I want to jump into your book, the fix yourself handbook. I actually kind of giggle when I read the title because it's like to fix yourself, but you don't really need fixing because you're already whole and perfect. Right. So I, I love that you're even gig smiling yourself. So tell us about this book. Like how did it just come about? Well, it, it, it's, it's been the, the program I've used in counseling uh, a little over, I think it's 22 years now. You know, I, when you counsel, as long as I have, you really get a feel for what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that if you're going to continue to be good in what you're doing, you have to change just like everyone else. And um, one of the real difficulties for people in my profession is that we get stuck doing the same thing over and over mm -hmm. again. People come in and then they don't feel the fit anymore. So I wanted to do something that I know could be dynamic, could, could, could apply to anyone, could transition as people transition. And I put, away, I put together something I call the process way of life, which goes right back to what you said. It's all, it's all been in us. You know, we're not mm -hmm. broken. But I want it, it's, And it's about processes, learning this process, that process to, do, to deal with whatever comes up. And I just wanted to teach people what those processes were. And if you use them every day, you don't get caught up in all of those things because they're all positive energy things to do. Yeah. So that's where the book came from. The book is, in fact, the written representation of that program. Okay. So a way of life. I love that concept because that sort of brings energy into like the whole life cycle and seasons and the way we're, our bodies have really been conditioned to, to live well, right? So what you put in, then you manifest out. So in your experience, and I'm curious, cause the world seems to be kind of stuck right now. What really does keep us stuck and sort of frozen? Our, the answer is really simple. We get away from doing it from ourselves. We are trying to fit in with what's trending. You know, a, a simple, simple um, statement. Uh, let's all look for the new normal. That is insanity to look. Where are you looking? Who, who had the, somebody have that? You have to go climb the mountain and there's the, the prophet with the new, no, I don't know what they're yes. talking about. 
the normal is something you are going to create, all of us, we're going to create based upon what's inside us and our willingness to interact with our environment. It's really pretty simple, but you got to know what's inside and how to use that first. Otherwise, you can't, you can't uh, positively react uh, or sorry, interact with what's out there. You've got to know you. So we so basically we've been doing it backwards all along. Oh, yes, we have. We've been like function, like here's the outside. Okay, let me figure out how I fit in and belong to this outside world instead of let me figure out who I am and how I belong to that, that person I am. And now let me go figure out where I belong outside. Exactly. And, and it's work. You know, that's why we, it's a program that I teach. It's not something that, you know, if, uh, 10 easy steps in about a year or six months, you'll have this and life gets perfect. Your life goes on every day. The world changes every day. So there's all this transition, all these periods of time that are undefined. So, you know, if you're going to try to get definition from a world that's constantly in flux and changing, well, then either you need to change with it, which keeps you then ungrounded and, and half you know, insane, or you are going to get grounded inside. So while the world changes, you say, okay, I can understand. I can define that change. I can see where that's going. Don't think I want to be part of that one, or maybe I'll be part a little bit a part of it, but not, not as much as I'd like to. And I make decisions that gives me options. It gives me control over my life. That's what I want. Then I can see where I want to uh, fit into the world and how, you know, what kind of player I want to be. Yeah, because we really have a lot more free will than we believe we do sometimes. Oh, we do. That, I mean, and, that, and that's the concern. We have so much free will that we don't, we, we just don't know how to use it. Again, when you, when you define all the things, and I'm talking about honesty and I'm talking about gratitude and humility and all these mm -hmm. kinds of things, you get into these and learn how to use all these. You define yourself and you'll get to some parts that aren't defined so well. And you'll say, you know what? I can play with that part. I can actually see how I want that to go. I can create in me. And again, before you create externally, you really create inside first. That's why artists can do what they do so well, because they yes. create inside first. Now their external representation can come out. It's a very simple premise. And we don't always believe we are these creative creatures as we are. I mean, we don't approach everything in our life from a creative space. We approach it as just almost like a step-by-step -step process to go do outside of ourselves. But if we tapped into that creativity, like artists and writers, and it would, the world would look so different. You know, I, I do a whole chapter on creativity and, and you're right. Uh, passion the same way. We, we, we're not passionate. We're, we're mundane. We're not special. Mm -hmm. Well, there's that singer over there and that sports person over there and the writer and whatever it may be. And look how creative they are. And I'll compare myself with them. And I'm not creative. You have compared yourself with their end product, but you haven't seen all the work that was done in order to get there. Some of them will have stumbled, have stumbled into it. it you know, that's 10%. It, that's there. Right. Most of them have struggled. Ask an actor what they've gone through before they get the big part in the, in the movie, you know, and, and all the crazy, insane, insane things they had to do and learn. It's just, there's a creative process. If we're going to be creative, then we are going to be creative inside first because you're not putting your own mark on anything until you define what the mark is. Well, and sometimes that creative process lends itself to also letting go and surrendering to something outside of yourself, like something bigger than yourself to come in and help you formulate. And I feel like there's a lot of people that that whole mark between intellect and spirituality seems to be like a battle that we're constantly battling over. Do you feel like that too in your work? Like, do you see that where it's like, oh no, if the books don't say it or the research or the evidence doesn't prove it, then the spirituality piece doesn't exist when we know it does. Uh, you know, I, again, I do a chapter as you get toward the end of the book and you get to what I call the mm -hmm. higher order processes. Faith is one of those. And it doesn't have to be, you know, people come in and, and what they're happening is I was called the G word. Oh my God, I can't, I don't know what that is. I'm not going to believe whatever it may be. And I just say, open your mind, stop being a limited thinker. Science mm -hmm. and God do go together. You just don't yeah. know how, because you haven't defined it yet. 
you know, I mean, and this has been defined by people far, Einstein did this, you know, yes. century ago. Yes. This has been there, but, I, and I don't even tell them, you know, go, be, go have faith and, and be a person of God. I simply say, stop being a limited thinker. Stop saying that, okay, my ability to open the parameters of, of my mind stops here. Open it and see where it goes. Maybe you mm -hmm. won't like it, maybe you will, but get there and find out at least. If, if you're saying, I don't like the whole concept of God, I say, well, did you read all the books? Did you read the Bible or the Quran or whatever it may be? Did you go do all the, did you do an exhaustive search so you know where you stand? And it's, and this, and I'm saying that with faith, I'm saying it with every process I teach, maximize the potential of that process. The more you do, the more you, the more you receive. Well, and, and the concept of like abundance and free will do go together because like, as you're talking about, okay, someone doesn't want to subscribe in the concept of God. Okay. Well, abundantly there's, you know, a thousand other way, other ways of looking at it, pick one of those that, that, that resonates with you because we're all different in that way. Find what resonates with you. The concept is that you have faith in something larger than you that sort of has a governing over how we're all, you know, goodness, our goodness and our heart centered spaces of living well and, and, and deserving goodness in our lives. Well, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I went into this thinking that uh, people had a uh, problem with God. But what I realized is they have a problem with faith. Yes. It's not just faith in God. They don't want to have faith in anything. No. Uh, and you mentioned the word surrender. Humility, you know, is, is looked at this as a weakness. Humility is a huge sense of power once you understand it. Uh, faith, you know, I, I, I talk about a movement from concrete to abstract faith. They're trying mm -hmm. to look at abstract faith, which is God and all the things you can't, you can't touch uh, before they even have faith on the concrete level. So again, it, to me, I said, just treat it as another process. Mm -hmm. Something else in my life I'm going to investigate. I'm not going to make a decision before I get there. I'm not going to critically investigate it. I'm just going to go search out as much information as I can find, see where it takes me. It may take me to faith or it may not, but it, I guarantee it will make changes in me along the way. And I have some control over what those changes are. A lot of what you seem to talk about in the book and what you're even sharing with us today are even the word process, our brains are wired for that um, executive functioning ability to see something in a process format and, and to follow through. And so it's really like we're wired for the kinds of things you're sharing with us in that book to, to it's easy adaptability. That's, I guess, the word I'm coming from. It's easy adaptability to be able to morph and to formulate a different way of living life based upon processes because your brain wired is wired for that, right? Exactly why it's a real good point. It's exactly why I use them the way I do. Uh, you know, as I tell people, uh, nothing I wrote is groundbreaking. Oh my God, he put the theory of the world together. I'm not throwing fancy acronyms so you can sell the book with it. What I'm doing is simply grabbing onto what we already have inside us. So it, it, and that being the case, just as you said, it's already there. We're wired for mm -hmm. it. We should quickly be able to, to, to grab on, to hold this, uh, to hold on to these principles and begin to use them because they flow with the human grain, if you will. They yes. flow with the way we are wired. If they didn't, we'd have trouble. We look at it and say, that's a hard, I, you know, I, I really have conflict doing this one. No one will you, I, I've never heard anyone in, uh, in the office or with the book say, I had a problem doing that one. It didn't seem to flow right. They're right, all right. saying, my God, I had this all the time and I didn't <laughs> know it. No one told me. <laughs> that's because that's what's so, I think I love the word aha more than anything, because it's so mind blowing, literally, when you realize that everything you've ever needed has always been right here. You, we're, we're running and chasing, but it's always been right here. We just have never, um, and I love how you, you get to that, that part and you kind of the theme of slowing our lives down so that we're not missing these things that we have the adaptability to, to just kind of flow into. 
And that's always been there. And that's what I'm trying to get people to understand. When you ask the question, why, when I focus all my attention out there, do I never become satisfied? It's because nothing's out there. Right. It's all here. Think about it this way. There are all these, uh, everyone in the world with an internal force, like all of us, that's out there, all being individuals out there. And that's what you're trying to grasp. But that's their statement. That's their individually. Everyone will have their own way of dealing with things. Mm -hmm. Go inside, find out who you are. It's very simple. And I provide step by, I mean, at the end of every chapter, I say, okay, here's the issue we talked about. Now do these five or six or seven things. I mean, I leave nothing ambiguous. Do these things, keep on doing them, and you're going to get to the next level. It's child's play when you look at it. Well, it's interesting you say that because when I was in the school system, we would teach teachers how to help students with their behavior that may not be appropriate to to teach it and to help them learn more appropriate. So we'd put things in place and then the behavior would become appropriate and they'd pull the things out and then they the behavior would go back and they would not understand. And I'm like, well, because the things you need to be doing, you had in place and it worked. Don't pull them back out. So I love that you said it's like child's play because you know when we give people strategies or support systems, to help them gain momentum in their life to, to living differently, right? And to have goodness come into them. And then they stop doing them. And then they wonder why their life sort of falls apart. Well, your body needs certain things to keep it going. Body and the mind. And, you know, I, I always use the diet as an example. I said, okay, uh -huh. you want to lose 50 pounds. So you used whatever program you thought was uh, going to work for you. You go out, you lose the 50 pounds. So what do you do? You stop the diet. <sighs> Got to my goal. I am great. And then I can cheat a little bit and I can cheat a little bit. And uh -huh. you're down the road. You say, I have 50 pounds again, because it's something that has to be done over and over. You know, I, I, I when the people come in the office and they're, they're very heavy people and they want to lose weight, they say, how do you stay so thin? And I say, because I'm not doing what you're doing ever. Uh, that's, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it's a lifetime plan. If I decide yes. that I want to have three pieces of pizza and then some ice cream and maybe uh, whatever chips or whatever later on, it's going to go on. I don't do those things. So it's, it's just simply developing a life plan that works for you mm -hmm. and then living it every day. And, and the key I tell people is you're not going to get away from your comfort zones. They're not comfort zones anyway. You think they are. Right, um, right. You're not going to get, you'll still have comfort zones. You will have a lot of fun. You'll embrace life. You'll have all the fun you have now at a higher level and you'll feel better. That's what we're looking for. Isn't that funny though, that we're so afraid of change and literally when things do change, we're not afraid. I like, think we love the, the new ways, right? We love all the goodness that comes in, but we are so afraid to change. And that fear right in that space, that little space right before the, the actual things begin to turn, it really keeps us locked in old patterns. We like, we think we like things that are the same. The brain's way of working is to be automatic, to simply mm -hmm. you learn it, then you apply it and you, apply. but the problem is that generalizes to some of the dysfunctional states like you know again you know, maybe you had a, a few chips and you watched a movie now it's you know you you watch movies all the time so there's more chips and more chips and more and something else by the time you're done you're putting on weight because your comfort zone began to work against you there's a a, a, a neurological thing called uh, habit formation the mm -hmm. brain gets used to the habit that we're in but it gets used to new habits too so it will introduce the same comfort zone at the new level, if you are willing to give that level enough time to develop, that's what we're looking for. You know, you exercise. Oh my God, I can't exercise. I can't even do a push up. Now you did two. Now you maybe you did three. Maybe you got on the treadmill and you could barely yeah. walk on it. Now you're doing 20 minutes. You got there little by little and you turned what was a horrible, in your mind, a horrible, uncomfortable place into a very comfortable place. Now you're challenging yourself and you want to go. 45 minutes on, on the treadmill and increase the, 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 uh, the, the difficulty level. That's the way the brain works. The brain likes to be challenged, then get comfortable and then be challenged again. It's a cycle the brain never gets away from, but we get away from it. And that's what causes us problem because our brain is not wired for that, for all this 
complacency, the sitting back. It doesn't know mm-hmm. what to do with that. So right. what it, it does, wants to keep going. Right? Like, so what it does is since you're not introducing anything new, it expands within the confines of your comfort zone. So now what used to be a little bowl of chips is a big bowl. The mm-hmm. brain is going to constantly try to keep you happy and, 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 and it, it, you know, make that comfort zone that much bigger. To, mm-hmm. so if, if we're willing to switch it a little bit, put a few new things into it, we learn, we feel better, the brain is happier, and we don't get stuck in all of these these uh, dysfunctional places. Well, the brain really likes novelty. So by doing what you just talked about, where instead of doing this, just add a little, little tiny bit of new something, that novel approach or novel idea or novel process, the brain likes that. It sort of takes attention to that and begins to create new neural pathways down that route. And, and that's another key because those pathways are very important. You know, t- take a vacation, you, you know, maybe you always went to the, to the shore. Well, this year you said, we're going to go to the Grand Canyon. You come back mm-hmm. and say, my God, that was really neat. And, mm-hmm. and it was, it was different, but your brain said it's, you know, it's, it, it's, there's the wow factor. Then we have the wow factor at the shore anymore. The water comes in, you feel really good. And then you find people going to the shore. Oh, we've been going there 20 years. And I say to the same place. <laughs> uh, that, that's your vacation. I mean, if you own a home there, I guess you go there, but, but you know, uh, you, you go to a different state, you go to something different, you go to a different country. It's the same thing on the daily level, throw something new in, change your routine around. It's, it's nothing grandiose, change the order of the way your, your, your day works. Just throw things at your brain that are different. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a 10 on a scale of one to 10. It can be a two. That's okay. Right. It doesn't matter. The brain just likes change. Doesn't have to have a magnificent change. Just change. Change things up. Give yourself some new experiences and, and see how your brain works with those. That's all. What do you think has led us to be so routine, but at the same time, so clustered with busyness that to hide and negate the mundane? It's almost like we're working against each other all the time, ourselves all the time. We are creatures of habit. Uh, we have so much. This is the other thing that, you know, we talk about uh, ironic statements. We, we don't have anything that we want. Look around your home. <laughs> you have too much. I, I always talk about this. I call it the sneaker effect. When I was a kid, you know, there were only three brands of sneakers and mm-hmm. you can get white ones or black ones, high top or low riders. And every now and then one of the companies came out with a red one and for a little, and everybody ran for that. And and we were thrilled to have those simple choices. Now you go into the sporting goods stores and there are walls with sneakers in and kids go in and say, there's nothing here I like. And I say, huh? (laughs) Ours were made of canvas. They lasted (laughs) the summer and they ripped. (laughs) And we were thrilled. Because I'm always like, when my kids were little, I'd be standing there. And you're making me laugh because I'm like, pick one, pick one. I mean, we are not leaving this store to go to another store. We've been to three, pick one. I don't care what it looks like. And they look at me all upset because their friends were all having, and I'm like, this is utterly ridiculous. Pick one. It's a tennis shoe for gosh sakes. Yes. That's so funny that we, we have too much. And then again, Mm -hmm. we're trying to establish some type of a routine so yeah. we just we get stubborn and we just stay in the routines. And, uh, you know, th- there's a big world out there if we're willing to look. So let's talk about emotions because they're so fun to talk about. And our whole worldly society right now is just bombarded with noise and emotional noise. What do you think is the most challenging emotion that we have as humans? I would think fear. <clears throat> fear paves the way for a lot of negativity fear manifests you know uh, in, in, in itself as anger um mm-hmm. it keeps us from challenging ourselves from doing things or we're afraid we're going to be judged all, you name it we're always afraid and uh, you know and and if you think about it fear doesn't live really in the moment you're in you said it yourself you you're, you're afraid of something happening the moment it happens we say well i can do that you know it's all yeah. the anticipation fear just it, it, it moves us away from the things we can do. It really, it makes us feel weak. Uh, yeah. it, makes us, it keeps us in places that are, uh, you know, toxic and dysfunctional when we should be moving out of those things. It's all about being able to understand fear, to define it, 
and then just simply to, to, to have a plan to move past it. And it's really not that difficult. You, you, you just don't take fear as a global thing. It's one fear at a time. I have a fear of spiders or, or a, uh -huh. a needle or whatever it may be. You take those one at a time, go through them, uh, let your mind understand that it can work through these little things. And then, you know, you know, you can take on some bigger things, but we have to deal with fear first. Well, that's interesting because I never thought about that. When you're in fear, you really are either in the past or the future. You are you're not really in the present. There's, because no in time, the, there's no time for it in the present. You're doing it. You're in it. You're in it. You have, and you have yeah. everything you need in that that's moment. It. So yeah, that's, I just am like getting this whirlwind of like, whoa. I remember never... as kids, uh, them teaching us how to swim. Oh, there we are uh -huh. afraid. We didn't know how to swim. And now today we do all the swim lessons. The way they taught us was to pick us up and throw us in the pool. And <laughs> once you were in there, you were doing whatever, act like a crazy person. And most of us, you know, they stayed on the side ready to dive in and get us. But, they, you know, once you're in, you're in, you know, and that's what we're afraid of today. You know, once we're in the situation, we have no choice but to survive in it. Our brains are built for survival. Yeah. So we're going to do what we can to survive that. It's all this stuff we feed ourselves. Well, if I get in the water, I don't know there could be a current. I might go down, you even start. Now you even start to experience drowning in your mm -hmm. brain before you got into the water. And, you know, you're paralyzed before you do anything. So yeah, because I read somewhere that the brain doesn't really differentiate the moments. So it doesn't know if you're in the present moment or if you're in the past or even if you're in the future. So you can really create a future fear in the moment as if it's happening in your body and it's not really happening. It's all based upon that, just that inner narrative going on. And, and that narrative, is, you know, again, you're hitting all the chapters I do. I do one on language, internal language, mm -hmm. and the way we talk to ourselves in our brain. Think about it. You may be you may be talking to people three hours a day, four hours a day, whatever, depending on on your uh, your vocation. But primarily, 80, 70, 80 percent of the verbiage you use is here, and we talk to ourselves and we say, "I can't. I don't like this person. I don't like that situation," and we're hearing ourselves say that. So. Not only is language expressive of what we feel, it directs what we feel. Mm -hmm. So when we start using positive internal language, telling our, you know, dealing our, our, with our world in positive ways, that we have no choice but to behave that way. We will yeah. follow what we say. It, 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 you know, the first teacher in, in your own head is you. That's true. That's, you know, that's so the true. primary. That's the primary. You can get information from other people. You're going to spin it and you're going to apply it. Your willingness to be positive and use as much positive energy as possible translates in, into how happy and successful you're going to be. And I think it goes back to like connecting back to, to you, that part you talked about with faith. So it's sort of like all these parts of you have to be really working together and have to be sort of what you call on the same page, because then it creates a whole momentum of your life to take a different path. You have now hit the crux of the program, <laughs> internal balance. <laughs> that is what we're talking about. As human beings, as I write, as I'm teaching, as I write, we are physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. We cannot deny any of those. The moment we take one of the wheels off the vehicle, so to speak, we have drag on one of those sides. If we're unbalanced in those mm -hmm. attributes, then we're going to experience conflict and fear and anger, all those negative things are the result really of being unbalanced. If we uh, uh, devote our energy to moving forward and doing, working with all these processes, the mm -hmm. processes create balance. That's what they're designed to do. Someone who works all the internal processes correctly, learns how to understand themselves, becomes more balanced in these four attributes, mm -hmm. more peace, more tranquility, more productivity as the result. So there's a lot of noise in our world, a lot of stuff happening that is creating fear um, experiences, right? That we're seeing. How can we, like, what can you offer for those listening to shift to a healthier way of, of even just taking the first step towards 
I mean, I think if we just kept thinking, what's the next right thing I can do? What's the next right thing I can do here? Because there's so much out there. I mean, between political and cultural and racial and just our health system in, in and of itself, financially, there's so many things coming at people. The first thing I talk about is a toxic disconnect. Mm -hmm. Get away from the media. There is yeah. go too fast and a lot to process and fear. And then there's the media and the, and the political realm and their willingness to purposefully use fear mm -hmm. as a way to motivate people to doing what they want them to do. Disconnect from the media. That's yeah. first. The, the government, if you will, or the elements that aren't so good about it, and the media, along with big business, that's your three-headed monster. It mm -hmm. always has been. And if you once we, I find that people disconnect, they've taken that toxin coming in their, into their minds and their bodies every day, and they are no longer experiencing it. And I guarantee you, if you disconnect, it will take you a good solid month to realize that you're calmer. You know, when, when yeah. we went through the presidential elections, when we went through the racial strife, when we're going through everything now with masks and shots and all those things, mm -hmm. people get so involved, they can't put it down and they seek out the media. And mm -hmm. we know today the media is, there is no media. I don't care what they say. No media is unbiased. They right. are all they all have a political uh, angle. They all are, 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 are well, yeah, I mean, big business and with everything yeah. else. Well, they're all pushing an agenda. Get right. off their agenda. Get away from them. Let them push it to someone else. Get away. That's your first step. Because you, it, you, you're asking yourself to go forward and be positive while you, with, with all this uh, influx of, of negativity every day. You're infusing your mind with negativity and saying, I want to feel good. Well, mm -hmm. you, you, no, that's like, I always call it like rolling in the poison patch and saying, I'm okay. I'm not going to catch anything. Yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah. None of us are void of like running through a patch of poison ivy and not getting it. I mean, if you're in it, you're going to get something. You, you're, you're, you're extracting something from it and you're smearing it all over your body. Your body is going to react and you're going to be in stress and fear. Exactly. And I ask people when you're on those news programs, when you're watching those, think, take, just take a moment and say, what am I thinking right now? Mm -hmm. How am I reacting to what I'm hearing? Because that's the key, not what they said. It's what you walk away with. You know, if, if you decide to, to watch a horror movie with lots of killing versus a really nice show with lots of loving, you walk away. I did a thesis on that when I was in grad school. Oh, you did? I did. I, 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 and I wanted to see what young kids did with violence versus loving programs. And what we did is we, we asked them to, to identify different types of stimuli, uh, you know, neutral things, a cup or, mm -hmm. like a, or a gun or people hugging. And the kids that watch the fast, the uh, violent show always identify the violent pictures faster. The kids that watch the loving show always then identify the pro-social things faster. So mm. it, it does have an effect and adults don't get away from it. That stuff comes in and it continually feeds and the brain does transition and become something that's representative of what we're constantly being fed. It's difficult to, to, to look at that stuff and not walk away, you know, feeling all the toxic energy. So well, and, and I would think that then how we're thinking about it then transmutes down to how we're feeling about it. And then our bodies go right into any form of a stress response that keeps us in more stress and more toxic health-related bodily functions. And then we actually start seeking out that adrenaline rush that we get because it, it's addictive. You know, yes. what people will say, I, I, I say, could you turn those when they come in the office? Could you turn the TV off? Mm -hmm. No, I can't. Well, I'll miss it. I don't know what's going on then. I said, is it affecting your daily life? <laughs> you know, you I can mean, find out in five minutes of turning the TV on what's happening in the pulse of the world and then turn it off again. Exactly. There's ways of finding out. Yeah, yes, there is. We don't yes. have to get so dig deep into it all to where we're part of it all. And then we're, we're not, we're not consciously making an attempt to live well. Well, you're back to that autopilot thing. If I, uh -huh. I'm letting the television think for me is what's going on. And I'm not backing away and saying, let me, 
just disengage my brain for a while mm -hmm. and start making choices that have nothing to do with what's on that television or 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 uh, my, my my cell phone which is horrible these days you know because you can go you, you can't even disconnect from it you know people have this all over their phone and they check in or it it, it gives them a little ding and so oh, you better go look at that headline I said, when, <laughs> when do you not have this with you? You're never, that, that's the other thing. We're never disconnected. So we never catch our breath. Again, yeah. in the old days before all the cell phones and all this stuff, you'd have to actually engage with the television set at a time when media was much less biased and reported. Right. Facts, and you got the, the, the uh, information maybe three or four hours later. So they had enough time to weed through it now it's as it happens it hits the uh, the wave and here we go we grab it and it hasn't even developed yet and right. we're formulating our opinion so we never get a break and we do this throughout society kids uh, are athletes 12 months of the year now they used to be athletes three or four have give their bodies time to heal now they play three sports four sports they you know i mean i mean soccer for example goes all year long indoor soccer outdoor soccer yes soccer. And I say, we don't ever turn off. It's so interesting that you're saying this because when my kids were little, they're, they're not so little anymore, but when they were little, it only took one year, I think, where we had all four kids in sports all year long. And we were like nutcases driving around, trying to meet all those needs. And we finally then said, my husband and I were like, nope, no more. You, you get to pick two sports. You decide. And we kind of managed it to where we knew what sports they would gravitate towards because they were their favorite, which meant that we weren't going to do any winter sport. And we, we really had to do a lot of educating up for our kids and really kind of sticking our, our, our heels in the sand and not moving from that point of, we need downtime as a family. We need to cherish downtime. And, you know, that in doing those few years of that, where my kids kind of, you know, wanted to revolt against us as parents, but now I look at them and they, they understand downtime. They crave it. They put it into their life more and I'm watching them become adults and realizing they have to have a weekend where they don't do anything and they just kind of relax. And now it's paying off. It does. And, and as you, as you and your husband, we also had four kids and they all played sports. Uh-huh. And they're, you know, between school and trying to keep them socially okay, because everything was wrapping around sports. Uh, that's when I said, this has to stop. Not only yeah. are, we, are we spending all our money on this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you know but we weren't. Uh, we are going, and we realized our friends essentially were sports parents. I mean, that's, yes. that's all we were doing. It was the same thing over and over again. And parents screaming from the sideline, travel 20 or 40 or 50 miles this way, I, I, you know. And that's when no one is disconnecting and we need time for our brains to say, oh, okay, let me think about what I'm doing here and make some yeah. choices and not just, you know, well, we got home at three, three fifteen. we were in the car, we were at soccer practice or football or baseball or whatever it was till six or six 30, we came home and then uh, there was homework to do. And now it's nine o'clock and we realized, you no, know, we didn't sit down and watch a movie or play a game or just talk, sit out on the deck, make a, you know, a, a, a fire yeah. in the chimney and we just we didn't do it all we did is ran the whole well, world and running. i feel like back in those days we were making choices so it was very challenging to not give our power away in that way to an outside force that was this is the standard and we were saying no we're going to take our choices back and we're going to do what's best for our family and some of those years were very challenging because we were it seemed like we were sort of butting up against a different system than what we felt was right for all of us. But now I look back and I realize we were creating a new system. So what, what do you mean by the power zone? Power zone is really the ability to go inside yourself and establish a position of power where you begin to work past what you defined as deficits, mm -hmm. um, alleviate toxic and negative energy, um, turn all that into positive energy and then develop a power inside yourself, which allows you to navigate through the world. It's not a, an in-your-face angry power. It, right, it's no, it's 
are full of gratitude, humility, love, all those sorts of things. But you now recognize that you have the power inside you. And that's what you're going to wrap around the rest of the world, not the other way where you're going to bring the world in and try to wrap it around yourself so you can feel uh-huh. like you belong somewhere. And I feel like the stories we were just talking about and sharing about when our kids were young and those decisions we were making that were from the, for the best of all of us, that puts you in that power zone of recognizing what's best for me right now in my family, my kids, my system, family system. And then you make, you make your choices from that internal place versus external. Right. Everyone wants to feel as though they have the choice. They have control over their own lives. We're seeing it. We've seen it with, uh, um, abortion. We've seen it with uh, what we're seeing it right now with masks and, and, and vaccines. Yes. We, we, we want to be able to, and that's fine, make the decisions. However, be able to make those from a place inside your mind and your heart where you're, you're making intelligent decisions, informed decisions. You're really taking some time to think about it and, and look at all the various perspectives, then make your decision by all means. It's, for me, it's always about creating options, enough information connected to the right places in us that we've worked on and then it unleashes that energy which you know is positive energy and it and right. it's well thought out and it and the decisions we're making those choices we're talking about are good ones that benefit not only us because there's a selfish component in all this decision right. making our decisions should benefit us and the rest of the people around us if possible the people in our world that's what is it's it's a global kind of a thing not just we, we have become too individual oriented mm-hmm. about me it's about me it's about me and we have a pandemic that continues to go because of that that yeah. you know, that's why this country is where it is and we will see more lives lost because we believe we can do whatever we want to do based upon emotion yes well and when you're talking i instantly went to like things we used to tell our kids that i still feel in everything we all do is it should be a win-win it should be good for you and good for everyone else in the family and if it's not a win-win and it's not good for you. Like it might be good for you, but is it good for everyone else in the family? You have to look at those things. Even when I was a teacher, I used to teach that in the classroom with all of us. You can do whatever you want, as long as it's a win-win. And that would really make them start to think through that discernment of, wait a minute, this choice I'm about ready to make, is good for me, but I don't know that it's good for everyone else. Okay. Then maybe it's not the best choice. And you know, what's interesting when it's not a win-win, even the choice you're making for yourself is often the wrong one. Because yes. the very fact that you applied so much thought to it being good for you and those around you says you've looked over all the information, mm-hmm. the parameter, all the, the various parameters, and then it's an intelligent decision. But when it's only good for me, that's based that you almost always, that's an emotional decision based upon what I want. And no one has the right to take that from me kind of an attitude. Yeah. And no one's trying to take it from you. That's the key. Who care? Who wants? Why do I care about taking your your your, your choice from you? I just don't want to be burdened or or affected mm-hmm. by your choice. That's all. If you're making that, you own it. You're accountable to it, and it benefits you and everyone else. It's the way we're supposed to live. So as you're talking, I'm really thinking about that party in your book where you talk about honesty. Honesty is tough for some people to really look in the mirror and be straight and real with themselves. We can project out a whole facade, right? But to really look in the mirror and say, am I a good person? Am I doing right by myself and others? Am I caring about other people as much as I care about myself? We're we're not really good at that, are we? No, we are packed full of defenses and uh and uh, mechanisms to keep ourselves feeling good. And uh, we like what I always call the initial layer of honesty, the one that kind of says, yeah, I, I got that. And, but if you didn't get uncomfortable, you're probably not honest. That's what I, 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 mm-hmm. I in, in the book, I liken it to um, peeling an onion. I think, you know, the first, uh, when you, you take that, that nice crinkly paper off, there's your first level of honesty. It has no meaning, you throw it away, it, and it, and you, and and it doesn't. It's not part of your, of your menu. Now you go a level deeper, and you start to get to the meat. And 
smells and it kind of your eyes yeah. water and you say geez you know this is kind of uncomfortable but you want to go forward because the end product is that dish you want to create mm -hmm. now you're at level three and the tears come and your nose burns and you can taste that thing now you're at honesty your honesty at that point is uncomfortable because you went inside and attached to what's really there and I tell people, you're not telling anyone this. It's not going to go honest and say, okay, I found this horrible thing about me. Everyone's got to know. No one has to know. It right. just gives you information to make a change. The other part of honesty is when you go deep, you're going to find the beauty of yourself in there too. You can't mm -hmm. find the beauty. There is no beauty if you're not honest. That, and that's what you, we all have to understand. The rest of it is that facade. It's what we have to create in order to survive. But when we're honest, we are able to get rid of a lot of the garbage and find all the beauty in there. Then we start connecting. Honesty is the first step, always the first step. And we've sort of, don't you agree, normalized dishonesty? Yeah, we've normalized a lot of things. I mean, yes, like, yeah. I'm always amazed at how we normalize things like dishonesty and being unfaithful or being, you know, cheating or robbing or we've just sort of we just sort of go along we want to just turn our heads and pretend things aren't there is that because we feel like that's the comfortable place but i don't really think it's comfortable no normalization is is a survival mechanism um <clears throat> in the wild it, they like to call it habituation when um for example if you if you go online and watch some of the safari shows in mm -hmm. africa they will have jeeps in the, and and all the animals are coming right past the jeep the lions walk right in front of them they don't attack the people because people on the jeep has been normalized has, has been habituated through all these years the brain wants to get comfort wants to understand its surroundings and get comfortable okay. so we automatically normalize we didn't get from a point where we were these um uh, people who you know stepped over homeless people so to speak uh, that we normalized or it's okay to step over another human being who's laying on the sidewalk and doesn't have anything. Um, we've got to that, whether that person got there through their own devices or whatever, there's still a human being laying in front of you and you step over. That mm -hmm. person. We normalize it because we see it every day. It no longer has an emotional or intellectual impact. And then we just simply go with it. Again, we're back to the same thing. We have to keep questioning. Is this the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. How do I want to handle this situation? Yeah. Do I want to give that person a few dollars. I want to take them over to the local McDonald's or whatever and buy them a hamburger or whatever. How, what, what do I want to do? How do I want to handle these mm -hmm. things? We have to get a, we have to keep asking ourselves questions and, and, and challenge, not even challenging, just bringing to people like to call it mindfulness to get to the point where you're conscious of what you're doing in the moment you're doing it. Mm -hmm. And if you can Why ask you yourself it? the questions, you get the information. It doesn't just flow past you on autopilot. And that's where you learn how to make healthy choices for yourself and everyone else. Yeah. It goes back to being aware, building that muscle of awareness up to know why you do what you do all the time. Right. Exactly. And, that, and using that self inner discernment to to ask, is this resonating with me? Is this making me feel good? Is this bringing peace and joy to my life and resonating and outward? It's all about being conscious and just not letting things flow. In the book, I call, I, I uh, like an uh, being on autopilot to what an airplane pilot does. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, now he gets the plane where it's up, you know, in the sky and it, he says, okay, puts it on autopilot. The plane is now making all, the computer's making all the decisions. The pilot is not. So while you're up there, know that the pilot's not flying the plane. The machine is. And <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm scaring everybody here, but, you know, but I think that, you're hilarious. Like you're just throwing, I just love your like approach to just, are you kidding me? Here's the way it works. Here's the way it is. I love it. We let it, it totally go. It's the way I, I handle everything in my life. That's why I'm loving this conversation. It's so fun. So they do that. We do that in life. We want everything to be without thought. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Here we are saying, I want choices. I want to do it my way. Then I say, I don't want to think about all that information. Let's let life fly itself. Well, you don't have choices then. What you'll do then is grab a big choice here and there. And I thought about wearing a mask has become a huge choice. Oh. And that, that, on a scale of one to 10, that's about a one. 
Yeah. Okay? Unless, unless you have a physical ailment, got that. But right. other than that, we now, since we're not making the major decisions, it's, it's sort of like the person who, um, you know, uh, w- always has these, these uh, people that go out to little things, you know, the uh, micromanagers and they, mm-hmm. they take little bitty things and make them really big because they're not making decisions on anything else. Right. It's the same thing in our lives. If we start making all the decisions, get our minds off autopilot, we won't have a need to infuse it with these emotion packed uh, situations that uh, come up down to little bitty choices that we really I don't have to spend all this time on. I, I'm liking the, the the shot in the mask people to the toilet pe- paper people in the beginning. You know when they, you know, I've got to have all the toilet paper, and there were you know, like 300 rolls in the basement. You know, and uh, none on. No. You know, because they 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 didn't know how to manage the situation. Mm-hmm. Heard somebody say, "Make sure you have paper products." Went out. I mean, I went into uh, I forgot what store it was. One of the uh, you know. Uh, Sam's Club or whatever it was. And I walked in and a woman was coming up with, with this, like 20 rolls of toilet paper on this cart she was pulling. And I said, do you need all that? She said, you're not, it, it, it's all going to shut down. We're going to be inside, get your canned goods. And I thought, she didn't learn, look at any of the information. No. It's the same with everything we're doing. Get off autopilot. Stop just reacting. Yeah. Make choices about everything. If, if your mind is, in a conscious place every day, you have no choice but to make decision after decision. The moment you take your mind off, you make no decisions. And, and, well, and I always tell people, uh, aligning with a political force is not making a decision. No. You didn't do anything. No, right. If you're making a decision, there should be action behind it. Right. Very inspired action. Something within yes. you is resonating yes. with something yes. you're doing. Absolutely. There's the energy behind it. I, I like back when you talked about like, get off social media, shut your life down a little, put some slowness in there. There's like a rhythm to that. Our bodies really crave that. And, and then I feel like what that does is if you disconnect from something outside of yourself, it gives you the space to really connect with yourself, your heart and your soul and who you really are and why you do what you do. Then you can start to see your patterns. You've given, you've given your mind enough time to, uh, to process information without your emotions coming in and, and, and getting in the way of all that kind of stuff. You know, I always say that emotions to the brain are like a virus is to a computer, you mm-hmm. know, uh, the program's supposed to run, then you infuse it with all this crazy energy. And somehow you think you're going to get information that is not infected. No, that's not going to happen. You need to take your emotions out of it. And you'll know this if, if you're getting angry, if your body's getting tight, if you're getting con- conflicted thinking mm-hmm. or, or your emotions are you know, all over the place, you know this. That's, that should be where you look at it and say, I got to stop this. I got to slow down, get my emotions out. Let me see what, what it really applies here so I can make some decisions for myself, my family, my loved ones, my friends, whoever that may be. Yeah. In the book, you talk about love where you are. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if my life is working well and I got some goodness going, I think that's easy for a lot of people to love where they are. But if I'm some of those folks that we know are out there right now and they're struggling and they're just challenged by the financial, the economic, the political, the, you know, and, and they're trying to shut things down a little, and they're trying to find their slowness and their rhythm to their life. How do we bring that acceptance, that authentic acceptance to here is where I am. Let me love it and let me make a discern, a decision, a discerned decision to move to another spot with it. How do we get people really in that sort of like cheerleading them on to, to joining that, that rhythm? Sometimes a, a, a person has just gotten so deep into it sometimes we need a little help you know it's like you know mm-hmm. uh, if, if you, you fall overboard someone th- is throwing you a, a lifesaver take it um go get help if you got to talk to a, a professional go do that uh, a friend or someone but you know get out of your own head uh, I, and i understand there are people financially that you know yeah. uh physical conditions abuse things mm-hmm. uh you know, depression anxiety got it all if you 
yourself can't do this, if you're trying to get to the point where you're trying to move past it and you can't, it's, it's telling you, okay, I've gone deep enough that I just need someone to pull me up a couple notches. You'll do it yeah. then. It's just that you may be stuck where you are. So it's, 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 it's getting, getting you out of that, that stuck pattern for a moment. Just go get a counselor, go get a friend, go get someone and get a different set of eyes on what's going on and, yeah. um, and change Reach the out. dialogue, change the dialogue just a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like that we've always looked at asking for help and reaching out as weakness, but it really is a sign of strength. It is because what you've done is you've, you're in an action position then. Yeah. Instead of sitting back and, and just falling apart in it, you said, I'm going to do something. The right. fact that someone's helping you is irrelevant. You've, you've taken the first step. And I always say to people when they come in the office, they say, you know, I never thought I'd end up here. I said, there's no end up. You took action to get here. When we are all said and done, I'm not going to fix your problem for you. I'm going to train you how to fix right. all of them. And you may never have to come back again. I, I always say I'm in business with you to be out of business with you. That's essentially what this is all about. So it's sometimes it's just the first step where you say, you know mm -hmm. what, just kind of, you know, uh, give me that push on the back that I need so I can get going and, 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 and start the process myself. Oh my gosh. This has been so enlightening. I have loved this because I feel like it's just where we are right now. We need to keep reminding people of this power, this internal power they have within themselves to, to, you know, adapt. We are creatures of huge adaptability. We've been born that way for our brains are wired. Our bodies are wired for healing and, and making sense of things in a very clear way. And we just, we, we just have to keep being willing to get back to that spot. Yeah. And it's, it's a daily process and people mm -hmm. look at it like every day I've got to work at this. And I said, no, love yourself enough to say you're worthy that every day you're going to do just what's right for you. Yeah. What's really right. Go inside, get all this stuff, get more, get more powerful every day. And that's what will happen. You'll feel that happening and you'll love that journey. I keep talking about life as a journey. It's not a yeah. destination. Once I get there, I'll be okay. There is no such place. No. Trust be able every day to say, I'm going to do what I want. I'm making the decision today to do all these things that we've talked about today. And, and, and I'm going to, I want to get better. I want to feel good about myself because once I like the position I'm in and like my world, that opens the door for me to love myself. Oh my gosh. This has been so wonderful. How can people get a hold of you? How can they find your work and get a hold of you? Yeah. Uh, you can just go to my website. It's my name, fostrigero.com. Type in that, the Fix Yourself Handbook, that Fix Yourself Power Zone, whatever. It will take you to the website. The website has everything you want to know about me, the book, um, uh, you know, everything that you, it, it, ex excerpts from the book are there, everything okay. you need. So you can really see, you know, kind of try it on for size. Um, you can buy the book there. It's out as, a, as, a, as an ebook, as a paperback, as a uh, an audio book. It's, it's wonderful it's all around. So uh, just type my name in uh, anyone that ha wants has any questions. There's a contact link there by all means, uh, okay. send me a note and I'll be glad to answer you. Oh my gosh. Thank you so, so much for being on the show. It has been, whoo, you've given me, you've given me even some things to kind of rethink about. So that's always a really, really positive thing. I'm glad to hear that. That's wonderful. So I'm going to ask you our high five questions. They're just five short, simple little things off the top of your head. What inspires you? Passion. To be passionate mm -hmm. every day. I'm one of those people. I don't get passionate so much about what's out there. That's excitement. I want the passion to come in, in from inside me mm -hmm. and then wrap around my world. Oh, I love that. How do you have fun? You know, I have fun in just about everything I do. I don't, I don't look for ways to have fun. Uh, I, I, I kind of hung on to the old value that the simplest things in the world typically are the most yeah. fun. And, you, and the reason for that is they demand most from inside you. The more grandiose the external, the less it demands from inside you. The simpler it is, then it demands more from inside you. And that's why that's the answer. I, I, you've probably never heard of why is the simple life? Why are all the simple things the best? Uh -huh. Because it demands more from inside. Yeah. You have, you have to engage your whole entire you body in yes, the moment. 
So Excellent. then it requires more from you. I love that. I love that. What's one thing you can't live without? My faith. Oh, I think yeah. I, I, I've opened my mind up enough to understand that uh, as long as that's in place every day, then that's, that's, that's the foundation. That's where I, I can move from. And it's not like I have to throw any of my principles on anyone. It just directs my life and keeps me grounded. Yeah. What does freedom mean to you? Freedom to me means um, living a life without needless want. Mm. Um, I think we, we become slave to an acquisition process that always has us wanting something. And then that has us almost a slave to trying uh, to try to, to accomplish those things or get those things in our mm -hmm. life. I always thought the richest person is the world in the world is the one that needs the least. Oh, that is beautiful. Oh my gosh. You're like inspiring me so much today. What are you grateful for? Me, everything. Mm. Um, again, I, I, like, and I, and I don't want to sound like I'm well, got it all together. No, I don't. What I'm saying is that I believe that gratitude is something that again is inside us. Mm -hmm. I don't look outside to be grateful. I, I am grateful, my, my wife, my kids, my, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I'm grateful, but gratitude, I believe has to be inside us and let it like passion and our love. It comes from the inside and wraps itself around everything else. So the, the smallest little things in the world usually mean the most to me. And I always feel like gratitude is a choice in the moment. It is. Like it's a, it's a little snippy, tiny little blip of a moment when you get to say, huh, I'm choosing to be looking at this from an eyes of appreciation right. versus not. And some moments are very challenging to find that, that thread, right? Cause they're big moments and I get that. But even in those big moments, I, I can say, I have found pieces that I've been able to say, huh? Even this little moment here, I'm grateful for. Because you had to work harder for it. You had to go mm -hmm. inside yourself and get more of those attributes that are inside you to apply them there. That gratitude is always the best. Again, not the one that comes with the, 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 right. tape, the shiny new car. And, you know, that's right. All outside you. And you have to let a lot of other outside noise go away yeah, yeah, to sure. find that inner peace there. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this has been so, so wonderful. Thank you again for joining us today. I really appreciate it. We'll have all of your information on the show notes. So folks, if you're listening, you know, get in touch, ask Faust. He's so knowledgeable, so helpful. Everything is so practical and, and lighthearted approaches to things you can do. You can do this. You can adapt and change your life and, and live differently so that you you have this peace and joy and freedom and comfort and, and a lot of fun. So um, again, thank you for listening to Living the Liminal this week. I want you to remember who you are and the power you have to be both student and the teacher within every one of your life experiences. So take what you need from today's episode and by all means, share what you learn. You are a beautiful soul. I love you. Peace out, my friends. Mm -hmm.